So uh, we have gained our independence. Um, he became uh, the de facto uh, first ruler of Afghanistan as an independent state in the 20th century. Uh, how was his reign? How would you characterize that? Chaotic. Uh, that's the short answer. The long answer is that obviously he comes back and he's received as a hero and whatever. And obviously, you mentioned as well that he's a young man, so he's got a lot of energy, yeah. a lot of ideas, and he's very much someone that's keen on modernization. Now, obviously, we have to bear in mind what kind of country Afghanistan was at the dawn of his reign. And let's I don't want to use the standard terminology, but, you know, we can say economically very underdeveloped, uh, a lot of social customs, a lot of tribal customs uh, practiced that are impediments to the growth or the flourishing of society. Uh, a lot of these sorts of things, uh, inefficient government, a government that doesn't really serve its people, uh, you know, just serves a very small select group of people. It's an absolute monarchy. So these are things that I'm on Khan, and I think anyone uh, of any ideological stripe can see this and can understand that Amman Khan saw this and was troubled by it. So um, he went. He went, and he his his main effort was directed at reforming and modernizing Afghanistan, which is an endeavor that ended in failure. Okay, uh, so uh, Amman Khan became the ruler, and he. Uh, uh, wanted to modernize the state. So what was his first step? How did it all start? So he, in, in terms of modernizing the state, his first uh, main thing to do was he um, promulgated the um, Nizam Nama. And we spoke about that uh, earlier in the, um, in, in the last podcast. And the Nizam Nama essentially serves as the basic code of Afghanistan. Now, one of the major problems with what's wrong with how Amman Allah's reign is covered is that, like you said, we're providing a counter-narrative here, and we should do justice to a very formative period in Afghanistan's history. So what we're often told is that there were the religious clergy, the religious establishment on one side, and these very small select clique of secular nationalist modernists. Now, this is actually pretty false, uh, because the Nizam Nama was not promulgated as a constitution. There was an explicit avoidance of the word constitution in order to not give the impression that the constitution or the Nizam Nama was replacing the Sharia. Okay? So, you know, the Nizam Nama tried to um, organize the government. It tried to streamline. So wait a minute. So, you wait a minute. You're, are you saying that Amon Khan? Uh, did not replace the Sharia. He, <laughs> he's generally considered as the enlightened, liberal, secular, and progressive guy who was against all the backwards things. <laughs> okay, so, so, so there's actually a bit of family history of mine here. So yeah. um, my great-grandfather yeah. was a man called Abdul Wasir Akhunzada. Okay, and Abdul Wasir Khunzada, I mentioned earlier on that in the reign of Habibullah Khan, there was a constitutionalist movement, Mashrut yeah. Khan. Okay, and the Mashrut Khan wanted a constitutional government, and my great grandfather will refer to him as Maulawi Abdul Wasir from here on out, uh, served as part of that constitutionalist movement and was imprisoned. He was also the Imam and the Khatib of Polakhishti Masjid. Okay, uh, now when Amanullah first became the Amir, what he did was he invited over Maulawi Abdul Wasir, who was then in Kandahar to Kabul, in order to serve on a commission to draft the Nizam Nama and make sure that it was compatible with the uh, Islamic Sharia, specifically Hanafi legal fiqh. Okay, so yeah. my great grandfather, Maulwi Abdul Wasir's entire role in this was to make sure that the Nizam Nama conformed to the Sharia and not just the Sharia, specifically the Hanafi uh, legal paradigm, legal framework that in Afghanistan is, you know, the most established. Okay, so this Nizam Nama was not a constitution, but okay. it was what? How would you it, define it? It, it served. It on uh, de facto, it served as a constitution, 
Okay, but on paper, the word constitution was strictly avoided and it was given in Nizam Nama, the basic codes. Now, a lot of the things that were in these basic codes were, like I said, they were formulated by ulama. Obviously, there was religious opposition to the Nizam Nama as well. And just like there was a religious, the, the religious that were in favor of it, but uh, it contained stipulations for taxation, for conscription, for curtailing polygamy. When I say curtailing polygamy, it actually enforced what was seen as the Quran's limit on four wives alone. And it's and, important. And by the way, by the way, sorry to interrupt you. You were discussing polygamy. See, we need to correct this because we are always talking about polygamy, but we need to be specific. It's polygyny. We Religion, don't have yeah. polygamy in Islam. Uh, yeah. Muslims don't practice polygamy. It's polygyny. So one yes. man having multiple wives. Yes. Thank you for the... I yeah. think that's an important clarification to make. So we need to also consider that Amanullah's father, Habibullah Khan, was rumored to have about 200 women serving as wives and concubines in his harem. And Amanullah, as a young man, obviously saw a lot of uh, trouble and drama and uh, intriguing in the royal palace as a result of that. So he himself was very keen to see a uh, sort of curtail, uh, curtailing of polygyny. And that's why the um, there was an enforcement of a limit of four wives per man. Uh, slavery was disallowed, so there were no concubines. Uh, there were attempts to regulate the dowry that was paid for brides, uh, practices and very sort of tribal uh, tribal custom there's a practice called walwar okay which is where brides are sold to the highest bidder uh th there were attempts to regulate these and there was also taxation conscription amongst other things so the nizam so, uh, so apart from uh we will discuss conscription and uh, taxation later on but apart from that so far the things that you're mentioned you know uh from a Islamic perspective, they don't seem really problematic. Obviously, uh, the secularists have their own views and perspectives on that. But mm -hmm. uh, if we just uh, look at these uh, reforms from an Islamic perspective, sure, uh, you know, uh, there was a certain level of uh, oppression in our society from an Islamic perspective. And uh, any ruler who would try to uh, end that kind of oppression uh, should be, uh, you know, we, sh we, sh we should be thankful that he initiated that. Of course, no, definitely. But I mean, I think it's, uh, it's useful to view sort of the, the regulations with regard to marriage uh, in line sort of in as part of the same package of taxation and conscription and I'll explain that in a bit but yeah I mean totally there was religious justification for the Nizam Nama uh, one of the key things that made uh, a lot of ulama opposed to the Nizam Nama was its efforts to uh, curtail the power of the religious uh, establishment in favor of that of the king so that i mean there was that and that was also by by the way religiously justified uh by men like my great grandfather by men like maulawi abdul wasi so to present one of the problems that we have when we're discussing amon allah's reign is we're presenting a binary between the secular and the religious and we're presenting the religious as a monolith that were uniformly opposed to Amman Allah. When, um, you know, just for example, the example of Mawlawi Abdul Wasir belies that. Uh, so, uh, without really going too much into uh, your uh, great grandfather. Yeah, exactly. He wasn't opposed to the king, uh, he wasn't opposed to his uh, reign, and he wasn't also opposed to his reforms. No, we could say, and I've, you know, there's, uh, he's been written about, and there are people that have said stuff like the progressive minded Maulawi Abdul Wasir, but we shouldn't, <laughs> we should, like, this, uh, everything that he did, uh, and like I said, he had his religious opponents, was yeah. off the basis of his own ijtihad. 
yeah. his own independent reasoning, which yeah. was rooted not in progressivism, uh, not in uh, liberalism, but firmly within ha- that. You know, that was firmly in Hanafi fiqh. So yeah. he also, you know, he also uh, it's when at the bottom of the page of every one of the basic codes, it was signed by him as Khadim al Ulama Maulawi Abdul Wasir. Okay, yeah. and to give it that sort of religious credibility, he yeah. also published a book called Tamasuk al Qazat, which served as a handbook for judges across the country. So, yeah. this early on in his reign, Aman Law is not attempting, at least at the surface, he's not attempting to displace the Sharia or to secularize Afghan society. What he's trying to do is to put in place uh, a system whereby Islam can coexist within a modern nation-state framework. We'll discuss the latter parts of Amman Allah's reign later on, but like I said, at this point, it's very important to note that whilst someone can't, don't get me wrong, someone can have their religious objections to the Nizam Nama, they, they, they were not, you know, this was not, this did not comprise the entirety of the religious constituency. There were people on the other side, but the other, the Nizam, Nizam Nama also included provisions for taxes, for taxes on land, for taxes on livestock, uh, involved uh, um, provisions for conscription. And as a result, there were a lot of rebellions broke out, specifically the Khost Rebellion. Now, why is this important? Because, you know, there's been a lot of discussion as to what prompted the Khost Rebellion. And naturally, especially Western authors on Afghanistan have said that, ah, it was the role that the government was playing with regard to women. These people could not stomach the idea that women were to be treated fairly or marriages were to be registered or polygyny was to be curtailed and this sort of thing. But it's also important to note that in terms of taxes, uh, the tribes of the Loya Paktiar region, as we know it, were generally given a large level of autonomy by previous governments. Generally speaking, they were systematically excluded from government, just like many other tribes tribes, but it was a quid pro quo de facto agreement, an understanding, whereby these tribes also enjoyed their own level of autonomy. So when Amanullah Khan comes in saying, actually, you cannot have more than four wives, uh, child marriage is not allowed, um, you know, the walwar practices like selling of brides, uh, dowries being relegated or regulated, all of these things come along, these are seen as infringements on the local prerogative of these jirgaz and councils. And also the conscription comes in. Now, it's in Thomas Barfield's book, the Mangal, the Zadran, the Ahmadzai, and the Barakzai tribes were traditionally exempt from conscription. Now we could say, why weren't the Barakzais rebelling? Well, they they were the royal clan and also they their tribal base is not in Paktia, it's not in Khost, it's actually in Kandahar and in Kabul. Now it's no surprise then that the Mangal and the Zadran are the two foremost tribes that actually rebel against the Manullah in the 1924 Khost rebellion. The 1924 Khost rebellion is led by a man called Mulai Lang. Okay, or in Pashto, God Mala. So a lame Mala, I guess he was missing a leg or something. And this Mala, what he would do in an, in an attempt to gain uh, opposition to Aman Allah and people on his side was he would carry the Nizam Nama in one hand and the Quran in the other, asking people which one they preferred. This was, this was how he gained a lot of support for his cause. And eventually the Khost rebellion was put down uh, Amman Law for the first, this is the first time and it marks quite a uh, upsetting, uh, so, disturbing trend. Yeah. So he wanted to tax people, mm-hmm. have their sons go and serve his army. What yes. was he offering them in return? Uh, well, he was all about modernization and whatever, but actually, uh, the military he left in sh- the in the care of Turkish military advisors, who did more harm than good, and no provision was actually made for how the families of these conscripts would be supported. So naturally, a lot of opposition was aroused, uh, even just disregarding the fact that many tribes were exempt from uh, being conscripted into the army.